Hello, and thanks for joining us as we discuss winter tree identification and how to identify a tree's species by looking closely at the bark. My name is Andrew, and I'm a natural resource manager at the National Parks of Boston and the Boston Harbor Islands. During this lesson, we'll discuss why we identify plants, tools for determining species, and review a few common species you'll find right out your door or in the park. It's important to note from the beginning we will be talking about what features to look for in bark and winter tree characteristics, but to really be able to identify trees in winter, you need to spend time with them and with the reliable guidebook. As we go through this lesson, feel free to stop or pause the video and write down notes or questions, or simply take an extra moment to engage with the diagrams on any given slide. So why do we bother to identify plants? Just think for a moment. You see a stranger on the street. If you learned their name, it would tell you a little bit about them, perhaps. It would mean they had an identity, a story, and their inherent value would be more apparent to you. The same is true for plants. Once we know their names, we can see them as individuals and communities worthy of our attention and protection. We can do things like learn to read the landscape, recognize the species around us, and find a deeper sense of responsibility and reciprocity with the world around us. So let's dive into winter tree identification. We're going to go through the characteristics of a tree that will help you identify the species in winter and spring. But really, knowing this will help you ID trees all year round. The most common and widely used identification tool is the dichotomous key. A dichotomous key is basically a series of questions that ask you to decipher if the plant you are looking at has or does not have a particular feature or characteristic. It guides you through a narrowing process and usually gets you to the species, or at least very close. Sometimes additional resources like alternative visual guides or asking experts will confirm the identification for you. For trees, the first big question is whether the tree is deciduous or evergreen. Basically, does your tree have leaves or needles in winter or not? As you can see from these images, broadly speaking, these groups have distinct shapes. Deciduous being more rounded and full, evergreen being more conical and angular. Further exploring this distinction, for the most part, broadleaf species are deciduous and trees with needles and cones are evergreen, but there are some species that break that rule in both directions. As a general rule, it is helpful to get you started down the right path, but you still need more clues in wintertime to nail down the correct species. This variability in leaves is why getting to know trees by the bark is helpful. So why try to understand bark? As was said before, in winter, many trees have no leaves, and even in summer, Leaves and needles on large trees are sometimes too far away to decipher. Bark is almost always visible at or near eye level, and it tells us a lot about the health of the tree. Is it diseased? Are there harmful, boring insects present? Is it dead? These all might tell you something about the ecosystem as a whole as well. So what is bark? Bark can be thought of as the protective skin of a tree. It has distinct layers with important roles in protection, nutrient transport, and growth. The outer layer has at its root the word derm, which refers to the skin. The phloem moves sugar from the photosynthetic leaves to the rest of the plant, and the vascular cambium creates all the cells and either pushes them inward, making new wood, or outward, producing protective bark layers. So how do bark types get their distinct textures of smooth, peeling, visible lenticels, vertical cracks, scales and plates, ridges, and furrows? To understand and explain this, I'm going to borrow heavily from what I've learned from the work and descriptions of Michael Wojcik, who literally wrote the book on bark. I highly recommend reading his book. See it in the resources slide at the end of the presentation. As mentioned earlier, as wood grows, it pushes on the slower growing bark that surrounds it. Different species react to this pressure in different ways. Some can accommodate the growth and remain smooth, but many crack and peel into different patterns. 
The bark characteristics of most species, however, change with age. One familiar exception, though, is the American beech, which is able to produce new bark cells at a rate that keeps up with the wood growth in diameter. Here, for me, it is helpful to, th helpful to think of the mathematical constant pi, since the periderm, or the bark, must expand three inches around in circumference of the trunk for every inch of wood that is added to the diameter. Over time, the bark can't stretch or grow quickly enough, so it breaks apart in reliable patterns. You can think of bark kind of as the wrinkly skin that comes with age. Other key characteristics to consider during wintertime are buds and twigs. If they're within reach, the buds and twigs of a tree are features that can help you further identify the tree species. In many winter identification guides, the size, shape, appearance, and orientation of buds, bud scales, and leaf scars help to differentiate species. Leaf scars are surprisingly revealing, so pay attention to those. Another big clue in differentiating species is the way in which branches and leaves are arranged. There are three basic orientations, alternate or staggered, opposite and whirled. This applies to branches and leaves. There's a helpful mnemonic device when trying to remember which species have opposite branching, mad horse. That stands for maple, ash, dogwood, and horse chestnut. So let's get into some common species that you'll find out and about in Greater Boston and where I spend most of my time at work, the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. Let's start with some deciduous species. We begin with a popular showy, woody, wetland species that bursts with color in early spring, the red maple. The buds tend to be slender and shiny and reddish in color. And the terminal buds are a quarter inch long or smaller and typically blunt. The bark of young trees tends to be a light gray and rather smooth, but develops into dark gray ridges and scaly plates. The leaf scars have three bundle scars. Next, we have red oak, a common hardwood. The buds are reddish brown, stout, and glabrous. And glabrous means smooth and hairless. The terminal buds, however, are large and conical and may uh, have subtle pubescence, which means kind of soft, fine hairs. The bark on young red oaks is smooth, but eventually develops wide, flat top ridges. Some think the furrows between those ridges form a pattern resembling sea tracks. And the leaf scar is a half rounded shape with numerous bundle scars inside. Distinctly different from that is the white oak. Its terminal buds are small and reddish brown and rather rounded. The bark tends to be an ashy gray with scaly irregular plates or blocky with large uh, stems. The leaf scars each have numerous bundle scars, similar to all oaks. A resilient and adaptable tree, the black cherry can be found in many types of places. The buds are very small, glossy, reddish brown and conical, sometimes sappy too. The bark is smooth with obvious pale lenticels when it's young, but over time the bark darkens and breaks into rough upturned flaking plates. The leaf scars in the black cherry are small and semicircular with three bundle scars in each. Gray birch is a species that typically occupies transitional areas between wetlands and uplands. The buds are slender, pointed in green and brown colors. When young, the bark is reddish brown with white lenticels, but eventually turns almost white and remains smooth, but for the large lenticels. The leaf scars are small and crescent shaped with three bundle scars each. Quaking aspen is what we call a pioneer species because it grows quickly and doesn't mind highly disturbed environments. The buds are glabrous, reddish brown, and the terminal bud is long and pointy and often resinous. The bark tends to be smooth, white, and has diamond shaped lenticels. The leaf scars are half round with three bundle scars each. One of the most ubiquitous coastal plants in, is the staghorn sumac. Technically not a tree, but we won't make it feel bad and we'll include it here. Twigs and buds are velvety, 
like the antlers of a stag, with round tan buds at the end. The bark is generally smooth and gray with very conspicuous lenticels. The leaf scars surround the base of each bud. Unlike most other species, the bright red upright fruits may persist year round. Okay, now we'll go over a couple of evergreen species. Eastern red cedar is a hardy juniper species that can tolerate all that the coastal Northeast can throw at it. Its leaves are kind of scale-like, overlapping in dark green. The bark tends to be a light brown with flecks of red, and as it ages, develops long ridges with rough and peeling bark. Distinct from that are pines. We'll start here with the scotch pine, a non-native species here in Massachusetts. It's found across the Northeast too, but it's not considered invasive. The needles are two per bundle. They're short and stiff, and usually kind of a dull blue-green color. The cones are one to two inches long and egg-shaped, and the bark is gray to reddish brown at the base and then turns orange and flaky on the upper trunk and branches. And our last species is the eastern white pine. In addition to looking at the bark, count the needles of pines. If there are five needles per bundle, it is likely a white pine. And you can remember this because white, W-H-I-T-E, has five letters in it too. The cones are long and have thin, smooth scales on them. When young, the bark can be smooth, but turns reddish brown with irregular scales as it matures. I hope that this review of winter tree, trees and tree ID makes you feel a little more connected to these plants and inspires you to take some action on their behalf, whether it's working to protect and plant new trees, volunteering in your local park, or getting outdoors just to connect with nature in your home. Thank you so much for following along and learning more about identifying trees in winter. I hope you found this informative. Here's a list of a couple of resources I recommend. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email. Be well.